Coming up in the Innovation Sandbox today, we're taking a bite out of data with Manta and Talent. We're live in 30 seconds, so grab your shovel and let's go innovate. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Prolifics Innovation Sandbox. I'm your host today, Kirsten Kraft, and I'm very excited that we have two special guests today talking about how we take a bite out of data. Our first guest is Ernie Ostick. He's the Senior Vice President of Products at Manta. And after that, we'll talk with Rolf Himes. He heads up Global Channels and Alliances at Talent. Now, we also want to hear your voice, so stick around at the end, and we'll have time for questions. And now a quick operational note about that. If you think of a question during the show, feel free to go ahead and type it into the live chat. So you should see that live chat window. It's either going to be on the right or the bottom of your screen. We'll address all of the questions posted there at the end of the show. So let's get started. First up is Ernie Ostick with Manta. Ernie, welcome to the Prolifics Innovation Sandbox. Thank you very much. We're excited to be here. All right, so let's get started with some basics. Uh, some of the folks watching, they may not know that much about Manta. Your platform, it's all about data lineage and metadata, right? So I'd like for you to spend just a minute to explain what that means, what Manta does, and why is it important to an organization? So thank you very much. That's um, you know, a, a wonderful question. And, you know, metadata for us is, is critical, but what's really key for us is our core focus on lineage metadata. What Manta does is provide companies with a full illustration of their data pipeline, where their data flows, where it flows from, where it's going to. And what we actually do is crunch through everybody's code, whether that's the SQL stored procedures or their Java or COBOL code. Uh, going down to the depths of the individual elements and in, in columns and the transformations that occur there. We look at all their ETL tools and their reporting tools, and we parse through and crunch that code. And in doing so, are able to illustrate lineage um, from an end to end in a visual fashion, but also provide lots of additional insight into how that data is moving around the organization. So maybe could you give a quick example of how lineage is used, like from like a business perspective? Why is that important? So it's extremely critical for a couple of uh, key use cases and governance and compliance are probably the two most significant that we're seeing. And it's so important when someone needs to understand when they're looking at a report, where the data come from? How is this calculation derived that actually provided this graph that I'm looking at in Excel or Tableau or uh, whatever the tool is that I might be using. And how did it get traced through all these different steps? You know, companies uh, over their lifetime with analytics have data warehouses and reporting systems and Hadoop data lakes and ETL tools where they've been flowing this information for a long period of time. And understanding where that came from is going to help instill more trust. And that's a huge part of the governance initiative. And certainly from a compliance perspective, especially data privacy now, understanding how I connect the dots between all the data that is personal information about my customers or my patients is also really critical. Okay, outstanding. So it's almost like, um... You know, you've heard the, the saying garbage in, garbage out, right? Let's make sure that we trust what's in there, that we don't have any sort of, of garbage and questioning situations there. Outstanding. Now, let's talk for just a second about how Manta fits into a bigger picture, right? You mentioned a few examples there as far as compliance and data governance. 
um, prolifics, we work with Manta in the context of our data governance practice, right? So that's kind of a part of, of what we're doing when we're working with a customer for compliance needs or trying to figure out how do they get more trust in that data so they can innovate with it. Where do you see the future of data governance kind of as a discipline and, and the demand for platforms like yours in the future? So that's an excellent question. Governance is just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's taking off and the demands for lineage have uh, increased even more as, a, as one complement to that governance picture, right? Uh, obviously understanding your data, getting a better data quality view of it, um, stewardship and better management of that whole environment to understand that it's critical. But one piece of that is lineage. And the demand for lineage is exploding. Uh, we have all kinds of requests for lineage for applications that are up in the cloud. We have demands for lineage for applications that are legacy systems in, in COBOL and things that are on the mainframe. And I think what's happening is not only do we have this requirement for trust and compliance, but it's sort of colliding with the fact that there aren't enough people and it's too costly and time um, resource expensive to do this manually. So you need tooling that can comb through that code and provide you with that lineage view without you having to cook it by hand, just by doing reviews. And in some cases, the people that knew that lineage, they retired or they moved on to another career. So they don't even exist anymore to go look at that code, even if, even if you could. Um, from a prolifics perspective, the uh, exciting thing for us is, um, you know, prolifics brings this expertise to this domain, especially in data quality and compliance. And being able to combine the compliance and DQ uh, expertise along with how did that data flow along those pipelines uh, is crucial. Absolutely. I know we're doing some, uh, some great things together which is uh, outstanding. So, okay, let me switch to a little bit more of a fun question for a second. So I, I see when I look at like your LinkedIn profile that um, you worked for a very large tech firm for a while before joining Manta. What is your favorite part of working for a smaller innovative company like Manta? And, and actually as a part of that answer, maybe you can also shed a little bit of light on something I saw on your website. It looks like your company was named kind of in honor of a manta ray, a manta ray being like a like an aquatic creature, right? So I'm really curious, what's all what's that all about? So for me, it was a lot about getting back to my roots. I started my career at a small software company and evolved to uh, spend the last 20 plus years uh, with a very large organization. Um, but what's great at Manta? and a lot of small organizations is the fact that, you know, we can make a decision and we can see the outcome of that decision, whatever its results may be, uh, extremely quickly. And so um, being able to bring my experience to Manta and where all of us are making decisions that uh, impact product, impact how we can help our customers very quickly uh, was an extremely exciting opportunity for me. Uh, okay. Manta, we chose, we chose a manta uh, for its wonderful imagery. I mean, a manta ray is a marvelous creature. It navigates, you know, the currents across the oceans, across the world. And likewise, manta is navigating everyone's data pipelines, like those currents for entire enterprises to show them that lineage and the data flow uh, across their company. Okay. Great story. I, I love the I love the imagery, and I see the actual mantra on your website. So it's uh, that, that's kind of fun, kind of fun. Um, so I am curious. There are other products out there that do data lineage, right? And I'm I'm kind of curious how how is Manta different from what you view as your competition out there? We are focused solely on data lineage. That is our core competency. We're not trying to reach into the catalog space and offer a fancy business glossary. We're aiming on lineage directly. And what I think is significant for us is helping customers with that automated lineage and 
applying it not only to governance and compliance, but also helping people with application migration, modernization, moving that information up to the cloud, and doing more than just giving them a visual picture. So, you know, think about, you know, Google Maps, go back 15 years, you know, you decided, you know, to wanted to go somewhere, you typed in a couple of cities and you printed it out and took it with you in a car. I mean, how old fashioned is that right now? I can decide where I want to get pizza, see where the gas station is if I need to find one or emergency, I got to find a, a drugstore for some medicine and it'll pop up on my screen. And this is where we see lineage going being able to be proactive and being able to identify patterns in the data and your data flows before the problems happen. So that we can create alerts that are part of the lineage and notifications that are part of that lineage and all the things that are the patterns that are generated by the data that we see. And that's uh, an extremely exciting place to be. Okay. Well, I know that, um, the feedback that, that I get from our team, we love working with, uh, with the Manta team. You guys, your creativity, your nimbleness, it's, uh, it's, it's a really great partnership. We really appreciate that. We do have like one more minute for, for one last question I wanna slide in here. So I, I know we're very focused on, on, on the compliance, the data governance pieces. Um, where do you see the potential for our future partnership? Uh, definitely. Um, moving in some of these additional areas. I mean, I know Prolifix has, uh, you know, an expansive experience in this whole data transformation, data governance space. Um, but for practical purposes, being able to uh, help customers with their migrations uh, to the cloud, uh, with their code modernization, I think there's just so much more that can be done than just, just the governance and analytics piece. And I think that's where uh, the full experience that Prolific brings to bear will be uh, critical. Outstanding. Well, we, uh, we're excited to, uh, to jump right in there with you guys and, and keep moving this, moving this forward for our joint clients. So, great. So I think that we're, uh, we're at the point where I'm getting the wrap signal here and we need to move over to our second guest. So, um, so Ernie, thank you so much for joining us. I learned a lot just from this very brief conversation. Make sure you don't go far. Make sure you hang out in the wings because we need to bring you back for Q&A. Thank you, Kirsten. All right, so now it's time for our next guest. Our next guest is uh, Rolf Himes. He is the Global Channel and Alliance's Chief for Talon. So welcome to the Sandbox, Rolf. Good morning, Kirsten. Happy to be in the Sandbox with you. <laughs> All right. Outstanding. Now, <clears throat> we're, we're going to continue on our theme of data governance, right? So we've been working, Prolifix has been working with Talon very closely around um, data governance solutions, specifically kind of in support of compliance needs. We've got some customers that we work with together that are very focused on that CCPA law, right? The California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, we're starting to see trends there. We're starting to kind of hear, um, hear noise out there that more states might be doing similar types of laws. And I'm just curious, what do you see in this space? Do you see this as a strategic area of growth for talent? Absolutely. Um, so CCPA and, and other regulatory compliance requirements that are going to be brought or imposed on companies are, are one side of the story. Um, they're important, um, they protect customers, they protect their data, and I think it's right. But for, if you're a, a, a company that has to comply to these laws and these regulations, and you just do it for the sake of compliance, you're missing the point. Um, and what we're trying to explain to, to these prospects and customers is like, well, if you take a second look at it and, and, and being able to comply with these regulations actually allows you to distill so much more information and data around what's working, what's not working, how can you optimize your business, how can you understand your business holistically much, much better. And, and then the, the, the adherence to compliance and regulations is actually almost an afterthought that helps you as a company to make sure that your CFO is not with one foot in jail, which 
in quotation marks again, uh, but actually your sales and marketing organization have the ability to understand much, much better what's going on in the market and with your customers so that you can react much faster. And COVID has shown us right now that many customers of ours and, and prolific, our joint customers, they're looking at this right now because they have the, the, the pressure of, of the regulation right now, but at the same time, they, they face the pressure of, well, where do I invest my next dollar? How do I make sure that I get through this um, healthy and stronger um, than how I walked into, into a, a, a crisis situation as it is there? Okay, so really looking at this compliance requirement um, as is not just, hey, this is something I have to do, but hey, this is something that's actually an opportunity for me to, to improve my business going forward. Um, yes. Are you seeing many organizations really embracing that? You know, are, are they getting it or is it just a precious few that really see that vision? Um, it's, a, it's a twofold answer probably. I, I think there's, there's a bunch of companies who, who have understood for a long time that data is, is the core, it's a strategic asset. Those companies, for them already today, CCPA or any other regulation is, is a side product of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Others are on their journey. And if you think about where we all come from, we all have these disparate data sources. They're sitting all over the company. And and tying all of that together and understanding, uh, to Ernie's point earlier, what is the lineage? Where, does the, where did these data points originate? And who touched them on their journey through the company? And do I trust that data when I look at it in an analytics report so I understand where it came from? And is it the same definition in revenue that we have in, in France as we have in Japan, as we have in the US? All of these things come together. So what we're seeing right now is that a lot of companies are embracing it more and more, but they are taking a stepwise approach and saying, okay, where's the biggest risk? And biggest risk frequently starts with PII relevant data where they start. And then they, they take this departmental approach and say, okay, um, where do I get the biggest bang for my buck? Where can I really make the fastest and best, most important improvements? And that's why we want to work together with, with Prolifics because that's a skill set, a, a, a very consultative approach where, where you can help understand the customers, okay, this is the perfect journey for your specific situation in which you find yourself. Okay, perfect. Now, I'm going to pivot just a little bit. I'm going to ask you a similar question to what I asked Ernie. There's other software products out there that do. I'm not going to ask you about Mantas. Don't worry. Okay, good. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have such a good start. Talent doesn't fly through the water. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so there, there are other software products out there, right, that, that do data governance. And I'm just curious, how is Talon really different from your major competitors? Okay, now this is a really good question. Um, the way we look at the world right now is um, we understand that there's a lot of uh, point solutions that are very strong. But if, if you're a customer today um, and, and, and you're facing a situation in which you go, um, I'm taking the best from this shelf and the best from that shelf, and I'm, then I have to stitch all of this together. I find that a very mm, cumbersome approach at times. What we see, what our customers really appreciate is we're taking a fabric approach. We're positioning, you can, basically you can layer talent as a fabric into your company. And whether it's, it's, it starts from an ingestion perspective, going over the classic ETL or ELT data management perspective, going into data quality, data governance, lineage, all the way to sharing data uh, with other um, either uh, applications or, or other uh, third parties or other pe people within the company. So talent, the data fabric that we offer is this end-to-end -end solution that allows companies to, to really, as a layer, a fabric on top of that. And I, I think that for, from a customer perspective, having the ability to, to start maybe with a nucleus, with a smaller piece of it, and then gradually expanding it and becoming and, and being having talent as part of their larger journey, so that they can understand their data better and and, and roll out a, a long lasting and secure data management strategy that, that puts data in the center of their attention. Um, that that does drive a lot of differentiation for us right now. Okay. Okay. Um, fantastic. Now. 
I want to ask a follow-up question to a couple of weeks ago. Okay, yeah. so a couple of weeks ago, you joined us for a digital coffee chat, right? So now on that segment, I did watch that segment as I was uh, preparing for this. Um, you shared that customers are right now because of you know the, all the COVID situation and whatnot. Customers are really focused on smaller projects, right? More projects, but smaller pieces. Um, now, when most customers and most people think about data quality, data governance types of initiatives, there's a perception of, oh my gosh, that's so huge, right? That's a really big undertaking. And I was just, could you maybe give some examples of how customers are slicing that up, um, if you will, eating the eating the elephant one bite at a time? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good suggestion to eat an elephant one bite at a time and not try to swallow it in one piece because that, that never goes well. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the fact that the elephant will be defending himself so let's just say, but let's go let's go back to so what we see right now is that um and, and we see that working together with with our partners like prolifics is um we identify the most important place to start with and and i, I alluded to it earlier a little bit it frequently starts with pii relevant data um, that could be one area um where, where companies say well this is where it hurts well, for other companies, what we see very frequently is they, they stay away from the PII relevant data because say we've, we're, we're covering that differently. But right now in, in this time of, um, of trouble, let's just call it what it is, um, we want to focus on our sales and marketing data because with that, many companies can say, you know what, I, I can take... I can reduce my level of complexity, put it aside for a moment because we've been working on CCPA for a longer period of time. So they already have some level of security around it, at least some they've encapsulated it, but they're now looking at, at relevant data for sales and marketing so that they can chunk it out and drive individual smaller projects, more bite-sized projects, and use it as stepping stone to really improve their, their, their approaches to, for, from a go-to-market perspective. And we see that very frequently, that somebody starts and, and makes a couple of small steps. And, and quite honestly, the cloud or the, the, the participating in the cloud and using the cloud as part of your infrastructure actually incites you to do that because it, Previously, like 10 years back, you had to buy a server, you had to install the software, you had to people that administer the software and the server and the whole nine yards. So just trying out something new always was expensive. You always had to invest a lot of money. Today, what we're seeing, what our customers are doing, they spin up another instance on AWS or on Azure or on Google, and they say, let's try this. Let's, let's just dip our foot into the cold water and see whether it works for us. And if it doesn't, well, fail, but fail fast. And that's what we're seeing a lot with our customers right now. They dip their toes into it, they try it. And if it's successful, they invest much, much more into it and they, they get much more, much faster, more successful. Okay. And the fact that you guys are born in the cloud, right, is very, I think that's maybe a little bit different from, from some of your competitors as well. It's a little easier to to try it We've out. embraced the cloud very, very early on. It's been a highly strategic decision on our end, and uh, we're, we're seeing that that was a very good decision. And and our 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 cloud business is is really important. Now, I do want to call out one 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 very important topic. Not no, there's no one company that's going to go 100% cloud. So you always have to have the ability to allow companies to work in this hybrid environment where not only is it going to be a multi-cloud approach, because quite honestly, there are quite now three, actually, if I take Asia into it, four or five big cloud vendors out there or, or platforms. But then there is your, your various uh, data centers that you as a company want to entertain, have to entertain, uh, going back to regulation or regulatory regulatory compliance. That's a difficult word in the morning hours, by the way. Um, so you can really get your arms around that. And, and you have the ability to orchestrate all of the in-house or data center behind your firewall, as well as your, your hybrid cloud world. And uh, yes, I, I do want to commend our, our R&D and our product team, our strategists, that that's what we've been striving to do and in helping our customers and do so. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. 
So it looks like it's time now for us to move on to our Q&A session. So let's go ahead and bring Ernie back in. Back. All right. All right. So again, I just want to remind our audience, if you have a question, you can go ahead and type it into the live chat. And it's going to be either on the right side of your screen or the bottom of your screen, depending on, on your browser that you're using. So, all right. So question number one. What, so this, this question is actually both, for both of you, for both Ernie and for Rolf. Um, so maybe we'll do Ernie first. What type of customer is your favorite? And is there a use case or a project that really kind of stands out in your mind? That's a great question. Uh, our favorite customer. Well, it's usually a, a site that has a particular pain right now that they're trying to resolve. And it often revolves around one particular you know, application domain. Uh, there could be a, a governance situation or compliance, but it might be specific to, you know, the risk department for that bank. They're under a lot of pressure. They know they have to get some regulatory reports out by, you know, October, right? They have a short uh, runway and uh, they just know they don't have the people and the power to do it. But they have a very, very good idea of what they have in front of them. Right. They know that they're sitting with a particular business intelligence tool. They may have talent as their ETL, and they know they're sitting with a Hadoop environment where all that information sits, but they have tons of store procedures there and the people left. So if they could just nail that lineage right now for that project, it's going to give them uh, you know, a really significant leg up and some major ROI on that piece. Hmm. Now, in all of our customers, they then have a whole litany of other technologies that they want to address. Uh, but those are our best customers right now that, that know what they're facing. Okay, fantastic. Rolf, what, what are your thoughts on that question? I really want to echo what Ernie just said because it's, 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 it's so important that a customer knows what, what, where their journey is going to. And, and yes, to a certain degree, we'll be able to help them to, to, to identify where the journey goes to. But quite honestly, we're not the experts for a certain bank or financial institution or retailer or anything like that. So having, having the ability to have those conversations with the executives and understand where is your journey going to and how can we help you be part of that and accelerate your path to that journey? And yes, as Ernie said, this is not a, a question of only the customer and talent. This is, this is a whole slew of various solutions that most companies have acquired over years. Keep in mind, many, many people have uh, uh, invested their, their career on identifying certain software products and, and, and plugging them into a company and making this company successful. So we need to embrace those, but understand where, where does this customer want to go to and how can we help them fastest? Uh, since we're, we're data guys, we like data. We like the strategy and assets around data. So uh, I couldn't even go down to a specific vertical. I think they're all important right now. Okay, fantastic. All right, so this next question, I'm going to direct the next question to Ernie. Um, how does data lineage fit with blockchain? Well, that's a really good uh, question from a future perspective. Uh, blockchain is a really cool technology and it does a lot of um, work to try and embed the lineage, at least within the data content itself, or at least about the data content. Uh, but the problem in a lot of cases is number one, not everyone is adopting it yet. It's certainly got good future potential um, and it requires some upfront knowledge of what it is you're trying to accomplish in that lineage as you're you know, building an application that can support it. So I think it has a lot of future potential to keep an eye on, um, but the plethora of code that is being developed daily uh, is far, far outweighing uh, what we can do in the planning for blockchain. So it's gotta be in our horizons looking forward, but the uh, ability to absorb and automatically handle uh, all the different code that's legacy, that's out there already, or that is growing every day with new tools and new solutions that are up in the cloud uh, is still uh, the major hurdle in front of all of us. Okay. All right. Um, and then one more question for Rolf. I know we are running short on time here. 
but uh, I want to slide this one in. How does COVID impact the challenge for data governance for, I guess, I think it's for data governance for companies. And yeah, maybe that was the whole slicing it up, but go ahead and take that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll make it fast because we only have a minute. Uh, you look at um, democratization of data. Your teams are now disparate. Nobody sits in the office anymore. So with that, you have a plethora of people who have access to data. You need to govern who has access to the data, who touched it, um, can they see everything, and how do they interact with the data. So uh, COVID has probably been accelerating that problem or the solution for that problem for most of our customers because uh, now they need to act very quickly and they now know that they are, um, that, that, they, that they work in a very highly separate and disparate uh, environment. So it's, this has been, if anything, it's been accelerating this topic. Wow, fascinating. Okay, so we're gonna need to wrap. It looks like that's all the time that we've got. Ernie and Rolf, thank you both so much for taking time to come play in the prolific sandbox. Um, it was great having both of you here. I really enjoyed our conversations. Now, as a thank you, we do have a fun little gift for each of you. Um, can we put this up on the screen? All right. So aren't those cool? They are, they're little caricatures of each of you. Um, <laughs> okay. So in the prolific sandbox, we're all playing in the sandbox here. So uh, I do wanna give a quick shout out to the artist of these caricatures. His name is Chip Snadden, and he's actually the neighbor of our CTO, Greg Hodgkinson. Uh, he's my co-host and hopefully all of you saw Greg on this show last week. So thank you, Chip. These are awesome. Um, and to our audience, Thank you for stopping by and be sure to come back next Thursday, July 23rd at this very same time because we will be digging for treasure. Um, we're gonna be exploring the concept of process mining. And if you aren't familiar with that process mining, um, it, it, it helps you uncover inefficiencies that are buried in your business processes. And those are probably costing you big dollars. So be sure to join us next Thursday and learn how to dig for that treasure. Until then, keep well and keep innovating. Thank you.